My name is Dustin Cabral, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the evolution of data visualization. So, in my heart, I'm a storyteller. Sometimes that means speaking in front of large groups of data-minded people like yourselves. Other times that means teaching thousands of students data visualization in my courses on Udemy. And of course, it means creating analytic dashboards for companies across the country. It also means creating my YouTube channel where I focus on power wheels, racing videos, and Nerf gun battles. And it also means reading to my two sons. So how did I get here? Let me give you a brief introduction to the last 17 years of my life. In 2006, I tore my ACL at a concert in a mosh pit. I know, hard to believe. Uh, and I had to, as a result, switch from my job in retail at Ocean State Job Lot to the audiovisual work study job here at Bryant University. There I met my future wife and mom of my two kids. In 2009, I graduated from Bryant with a degree in management. There were no analytics degrees back then, so I'm showing my age a little bit. From there, I moved to a company called FGX, where I was a supply planner, essentially buying reading glasses from China and selling them in stores like Rite Aid, Walgreens, and Walmart. I wasn't much of an analyst back then, but I did use Excel a little bit. From there, I moved to Staples, Inc., where I worked on the merchandising analytics team, analyzing bids in riveting categories like binders and paper. I used a few more tools there, including Excel, Access, SQL Server, and PowerPoint, but it didn't really hit until my wife introduced me to a tool called Tableau. Tableau was a modern data visualization tool, and I was immediately hooked. So I did what most of you would do, especially you millennials out there, and I quit my job. And I went to go work at EMC Dell as a full-time Tableau developer. Now about 10 months into that, I got a familiar phone call from someone, and they said, hey, Staples bought Tableau. Do you want to come back and be Tableau lead for the whole company? I said, absolutely. What else would I do? So I went back to Staples and helped build a team of thousands of analysts using data visualization. About a year into that, I decided I wanted to take my show on the road and impact more of the broader data visualization community. So I went and I switched to consulting with a company called Clear Intelligence, and I've been there ever since. So today I'm going to talk to you about two things. One, why data visualization is one of the most powerful storytelling tools that humanity has ever had. And two, I'm going to try and convince you to use data visualization in your own lives. So let's look at a quick definition. What is data viz exactly? Well, I like to think of it as a tool to better see and understand the data around you. There's thousands of ways to visualize data, but essentially it's going to fall into three buckets, tables, graphs, and maps. You actually use data visualization every day, even if you don't realize it. So maybe you're checking the weather for the week on your phone. Or maybe you applied to a job and you're checking out who looked at your LinkedIn profile last week. Maybe you're package stocking those socks you bought on Black Friday and the Amazon truck hasn't moved in half an hour. Where is it? Or you're checking your Wordle score distribution and comparing it to the people on Facebook and Twitter who posted theirs. And maybe you're getting a heart rate alert on your Apple Watch, hopefully not related to that Amazon delivery. So all that being said, data visualization can sound like a new age term, but it's not actually new. It actually started around 20 to 30,000 years ago with the development of the first paints and sharp edge stone tools. One of the most famous visualizations from this time period is called the Ashago bone. It was created in t about 20,000 years ago in Central Africa, and it was essentially used as a tallying stick. It was carved into animal bone using a sharp edge stone tool, now, we don't know exactly what they were counting, but we know it wasn't just for decoration. Fast forward about 15,000 years, and you get to the ancient time period in human history. This is where we developed the first writing instruments, like the compass and the ruler. This makes our data visualizations much more accurate, and we can spread them around a little bit more than we could before. Now, the Babylonians created some great data visualizations with their clay tablets. They were renowned for their mathematical calculations and notation, and they created these stone tablets to share those with the world. 
This is the Turin Papyrus map, developed in 1150 BC by the Egyptians. It was used to find and excavate stone for their massive monuments. The next time period stretches between the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution. And some of the inventions that really contributed to data visualization during this time period include the printing press and the typewriter. This makes data visualization spread much more rapidly and easily around the world. One of my favorite visualizations from this time period comes from the 1850s and was developed by English physician John Snow. Now, not that John Snow from Game of Thrones, but this guy actually did know something. Uh, there was a cholera outbreak in London in the 1850s, and he plotted the cholera case data on a street-level map to try and figure out where it was coming from. And you can see this big cluster of bars off of Broad Street. He found that, and he said, hmm, that's interesting. There's a water pump right on the corner of here. I wonder what would happen if we shut it off. He had it shut off, and it essentially ended that epidemic. So this is one of the founding events in the science of epidemiology. And one of my personal favorites from this time period is this 1869 cartographical map created by French engineer Charles Menard. Menard wanted to showcase Napoleon's march to Moscow in 1812. Napoleon had about a 500,000 man army, and that's denoted by this brown line. So you see over on the western, west side of this map, the line's pretty thick. But as you get to Moscow, it gets a bit thinner and thinner. That means he's losing troops. And I don't know if you know your history, but he didn't win this one, right? So that's what that black line is going all the way back. And you can see by the time he returns home, he has almost no troops left. So the most recent time period in history is called the Digital Age, and it represents a lot around the last 50 years or so. Some inventions during this period that really contributed to data viz and data in general include the personal computer in the 1970s and the internet in the 1980s. Now, there's almost too many to list during this time period, but I love the Pew Research Center, so I had to include one of theirs. This one's looking at the ideological divide between Democrats and Republicans over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, you can see the median Democrats and the median Republicans are pretty close in 1994 and 2004, but then in 2014, something happens. Right? The median Democrat and the median Republican become much more consistently liberal and consistently conservative. I bet if they did another one, we'd have them even more far apart than they are in this. And one of my favorites from the Wall Street Journal is this one on infectious disease. Now, they did this for a bunch of infectious diseases, and I'm sure it would be more than relevant to redo this again for recent times, but this one's actually looking at polio. And you can see this is polio cases by state, and they increased dramatically through the 1940s and 50s until you hit this black line. That black line was the polio vaccine. And you can see directly after that, the cases fall off the map. So we've talked about the history of data visualization, but how do we really measure its progress over that time? We can categorize it in four key areas, speed, data storage, automation, and accessibility. So let's look at those four categories over our four time periods. If we look at prehistory, which is around 30,000 to 10,000 BC, we're pretty low on everything in this time period. And honestly, it's just due to the harsh nature of daily life. You're lucky to be alive, let alone create data visualizations in your spare time. In ancient history, it gets a little bit better. The development of those writing instruments help us create more accurate visualizations, and we're able to share them across different civilizations, but we still have no automation going. The modern era sees a big change in that area. So the printing press, the typewriter, and eventually magnetic storage tape helps us store, create, and share more data across more areas of the globe. But nothing really compares to the digital age. We are maxed out on almost every single category at this point. Speed, data storage, and accessibility are all extremely high, with automation coming up in the next 15 to 20 years with the development of AI. So all that being said, what's next for data viz? Well, that really depends on the data. Right now in our digital world, in, in terms of data bytes, we have more data than 40 times the number of stars in the observable universe. And if you don't know that number offhand, that's 200 billion trillion data bytes. So that's a lot of information for us to handle. How are we going to do that going forward? We can do it through democratization, 
which essentially means lowering the barrier to entry for people like you and me to be able to analyze data. And we should do that through these three areas. So number one is leveraging free tools like Tableau or Power BI. These tools are largely low or no code. That means anybody here, anybody listening could use these tools, connect to data, and get insights out of it. And the last piece is data access. Now we already have a lot of free data available at the state, federal, local, global level, but you have tons of metadata about yourself that's readily accessible. You're throwing off data all day from your phone, your connected devices, your car, your computers, all that information is readily accessible to you. So I've given you a bunch of famous examples and tried to get you in the right direction, but maybe you guys need a real example from someone like me to show you that you can actually do this. So some of you may recognize this visualization. Maybe you brought your kids to the doctor recently or you're young enough to actually still fit on this chart. This is a height and weight growth chart for kids age two to 20. And you might not be able to tell from seeing me on stage, but clinically speaking, I am the size of a 14 year old boy according to this. <laughs> so as a result, we assumed that our first kid would be a little small and Callum was about six pounds at birth, which is on the smaller side, not, not extraordinarily small, but small. So our doctor said we should keep track of him, you know, check how he's growing and all that. So, and I'd like to preface this next part with a little disclaimer. We were bound to kind of overdo this. I was a data visualization consultant. My wife was an actuarial math major here at Bryant. So we were going to go hard on this no matter what. And we found the most robust app that we could, including the one with the little bottle symbols, the pee and poop widgets that we could put directly on our phone, all that cool stuff, and a direct export button of which some of my favorites were the excretions and feed CSVs. Sounds gross, but it turned out great. And here is my magnum opus. I call it the Calum Tracker 5000, just, you know, for grandioseness. Uh, it tracks everything about him, his height, his weight, his dynamic age. It's got his bottle feed times, the number of bottles he had in a day, the ounces he ate in the bottles, and cute little pictures for each month of his life through the first nine months. It actually rendered some really great insights that I wasn't expecting. Now, some of you have kids, some of you don't, so I'll explain it. On the bottom, you see this little gray line, and we got some peaks and valleys. So that's his time to eat his bottles. And fun fact, those peaks are where he was topping out his bottle. He was eating a lot, but it was taking him a really long time. And I think all of you know how painful that is if you have kids. There's actually speeds for the nipples that go on the bottles. So that peak, that's where we switched from slow to medium flow nipples, and you can see the time drop off considerably. Again, that happens where we switch from medium to high here, and it drops again. And we found some more stuff. Up top where the bottles are, you see that initial dip with the little notation? That's where we introduced solid foods into his diet, and he started eating less bottles. And this one over here, that's when he started teething. So really great insights all around. We went back to the doctor, and the doctor said, how is he doing? And I just couldn't handle it. So I pulled out my tablet and I said, hey, here it is. And he said, what is that? And I said, it's the Callum Tracker 5000. And he said, I still don't understand. So I explained it. And he politely explained that that was too much. Uh, and we really didn't need that much information. So you can kind of probably expect what happened when we had our second son. I had to do the whole thing over again. So our second son's named Fintan, and I did the same recordings, and I equalized them on the same axis using days since birth so I could compare equally. And it turns out Fintan was a much faster eater consistently than Callum, but they ate about the same amount of bottles. Interesting. But a little bit different on diapers. So Fintan had a very healthy digestive system, especially in the first week. And fun fact... You have about a 25% chance of getting a poopy diaper on any given day within the first 60 days of your kid being born. If you need any more information related to this, hit me up after the presentation. <laughs> All right, so what now? How do you leverage data visualization in your own life? So I have a three-step plan for you. So number one is get inspired. And maybe it's not about babies and diapers and poop and pee. Maybe it's food, maybe it's politics, maybe it's Instagram. Whatever it is, there's data out there. I once made a dashboard about Australian public toilets, okay? There is information for you to access. Number two is to leverage free tools like Tableau and Power BI. 
anyone in this audience can use these tools to get up and running with data viz. And number three is to share and explore. I've been to so many conferences and nerdy webinars and user groups. There are places for you to mingle with other people who are data minded like you to get inspired, to build on your skill set and improve. And I'd just like to end my talk by giving you a challenge. So I want you to go out there and make something, anything using data viz. Don't think about it too much. Just make something. You're a storyteller too. You just don't know it yet. Thank you.